about old emails. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, join us now, Gerald Salente, publisher of the Trends Journal of TrendsResearch.com, business consultant and author, and an incredible researcher about predictions going into the future. He describes himself as a political atheist and a citizen of the world. I suppose when, you, when you're in Gerald's line of work, that's a, it's a good way of describing yourself because there's so much crazy, crazy stuff coming down the pike. When you take sides, sometimes it's hard to get people to listen to you. His list of credentials are incredible, but we're going to cut right to the chase tonight, talk about his predictions for 2012, what he's looking at for the future, and why so many libertarians are, are eager to, to grab onto these, these messages of, of pessimism. Gerald, thank you so much for joining us again on Adam vs. the Man. Uh, good being back with you, Adam. So I want to talk first about uh, some of the currency issues that we're seeing, some of the trends in gold, silver, uh, a lot of up and down recently. What do you think the sequester has, has, has had an, as an effect on, on these prices? I don't think it's had any effect at all. Uh, gold prices have been declining now since the beginning of the year, essentially. Uh, you know, I'm not a conspiracy theorist. However, and I shouldn't say however, I'm not a conspiracy theorist. I believe gold prices are being manipulated, and I'll tell you why. If anybody doesn't think that things are manipulated, then they have attention deficit disorder mm -hmm. because they forgot about LIBOR. You remember that one? Yes. The yeah, London so if they're bringing interest rate rates scandal. to the tune of tens of trillions of dollars, they can certainly manipulate the gold market, which is thinly traded. And I say that because... Every major country, including China, the European Central Bank, the United States, of course, the Federal Reserve, and now Japan, are all, have all lowered interest rates and dumped trillions of dollars into their economies. And they're debasing the currency. So by debasing the currency, gold should be a safe haven. But it's not. And I believe the reason why it is still a safe haven, but the reason why gold prices aren't going up, I think they're being artificially pushed down. If they're being artificially pushed down, what's the interest for those who are doing the manipulating to keep them lower? I mean, wouldn't they, wouldn't they want gold to rise naturally uh, against all the fiat currencies? No, because, again, the central banks are the ones that are doing it. And all that you have to do is, you know, you short the markets. And by doing that, you're sending a signal that your currency is strong. So all of these currencies should be declining because they're all being debased. You know, it's as simple as that. You cannot keep printing all of this digital money, not worth the paper it's not printed on, buying up tens of trillions of dollars of treasuries and, and other securities, government securities, and propping up your marketplace. So now we have the new Prime Minister of Japan, Abe, who just put in a new head of the Bank of Japan, doing the same exact thing. We heard from the ECB head, uh, Mario Draghi, saying essentially he'd, get, he'd keep buying all the bonds that they needed to buy to keep them artificially sound. And we've heard Ben Bernanke say over and over again, that we're going to keep interest rates low to at least 2015, and they will continue on the QE programs. So they're debasing the currency, and by all measures, gold should be going up under that scenario. I think it's not going up because they're manipulating it, because if gold prices start skyrocketing, then everybody starts seeing the fraud, the Ponzi, Ponzi scheme, that's been perpetrated by the central banks. Well, speaking of currencies that aren't backed by anything, one of the recent trends is the rise of Bitcoin. Now that we see in, in uh, over $20 million worth in, in circulation, I, I think it's even more than that now that Bitcoin is trading for uh, more than an ounce of silver. What do you think this signals? What do you see uh, in, in, the, in the future for Bitcoin and, and the, the rise of, of similar digital currencies? <laughs> You know, I see, I see a potential for it. Uh, however, you know, it, it's, 
it, considering the size of the, the global marketplace, at best it will gain a fraction of it. I think more importantly to look at, for example, is the uh, BRIC nations and how they're talking about coming up with another reserve currency. Well, why, also, why do you say that the Bitcoin has a, w would only come to a fraction? What is, what is the limit that you see on Bitcoin's potential? You know, I don't know the limit, but I'm looking at other, other trends that are developing. For example, we're watching China become a major purchaser of gold. Now they rank probably about sixth, far beyond behind the United States, France, Germany, if in fact they have gold at all, Italy. And I say that because... All of a sudden now you're seeing more and more trading being done in the yuan. So there's too much competition out there from bigger players that are going, I believe, are going to grab a, a, more, a, a bigger size of the marketplace. So I, I just aren't really prepared to make an estimate on it because it's so new and there's so much going on and the pressures are so great that I think, you know what, you can look at it as, you can look at it compared to the organic marketplace in food to the agribusiness marketplace in food. Sure. It's a sizable marketplace, but it's small compared to the whole. And I think that's what you're looking at. Well, okay, and that's a very good comparison to bring up in the analysis because one of the things that, that gives me hope for the adoption of Bitcoin on a, on a wider basis is that it's seen as an alternative to the dollar that has a lot of the practical values of it, certainly, uh, you know, with a certain advantage over gold and silver. I mean, at least you can you can buy drugs on the Silk Road with it. But also that people are seeing it as clearly gaining in value when the dollar is clearly declining in value. And and I, I mean, to me, when, when you talk about the organic food market, I'd, I'd like to think, you know, versus mainstream agriculture, I'd like to think that more people are, are waking up to all the destructive natures of GMOs and all the you know com contamination in the foods and, and hormones and, and pesticides, and they're going, well, crap, i got to look out for my health. And the more that we see the desire for that growing on the Internet, you know, the more people getting educated, the more that that, that market is growing, the more people are, are growing alone but the, are, are growing at, at home. But the, or the, the, the counter to that is that, most Americans will still buy what's cheap and easy and approved by the government and go along. But when it's, it's sort of detached, right? Like with, with food, well, I, I might get sick, uh, you know, decades down the road if I eat tons of, of, of fast food, you know, and then the government's going to come in with some health care plan and take care of me anyways. You know, you've, it's kind of detached. But when you've got the immediacy of, well, geez, I hold dollars, they lose value. I hold bitcoins, they gain value. And all I have to do is click over and I'm in a different currency. It seems like that has much less of a, an immediate practical limitation. If it's not Bitcoin, if people are going to wake up to this, are you, are you predicting that there will be some other rush to some other currencies as people realize that they can, they can trade it online you know, for, for a, a very small margin or they can get out of the dollar at least in, in one form or another? I think what you saw a couple of years ago by the head of the World Bank, Robert Zolich, when he talked about having a reserve currency backed by more than just a dollar in the United States in a number of different currencies and also including in it gold. And that made the news a little while, but then it faded out. I think something like that is a real probability. Again, what we're looking at, Adam, is when you look at trends, they don't go in a straight line, and no one can predict the future. There are too many wild cards. So as I'm looking at the whole world situation and what I see going on, you know, I, I just look at some of the recent headlines. Moody's credit downgrade heightens economic, UK economic crisis. Bulgaria, protests continue after government's resignation. Strikes and demonstrations rock Spain. This is all within the last couple of days. Forecasting more recession and unemployment. The EU demands more austerity. Mass protests are up across uh, Bulgaria. Italian voters reject European Union austerity. And then you look at something like this, where income slumped 3.6% in the U.S. in January. And you just keep going down the list. Portugal this past week. 
one after another, hundreds of thousands of people taking to the streets. What we're going to see as I see it, this is a replay of the 1930s. You know, they say history repeats itself, but it's always different. It rhymes. You had the crash of 1929. You had the Great Depression. You had currency wars. That's what we're really talking about now. Then you had trade wars and world war. I believe we're replaying that same scenario and that these things don't end with all of a sudden there's a collapse and things get rebuilt and everything's fine. I believe the next step is war. And as I read those headlines, I can't see why people can't put it together. There's a war in Yemen. There's a war in Bahrain. There's a war in Libya. Oh, wonderful news today. They just closed down one of the natural gas pipelines that used to supply natural gas to Italy because the so-called militants you know, are, are in a fight with the security guards that are, that are supposedly protecting the plant. You have, you have street demonstrations, as I mentioned, in Bulgaria, in Greece, in Portugal, in Spain. You have, look what's going on in Italy as I speak, or as we speak, with Beppe Grillo now coming in with his five-star movement party. You're seeing economies collapsing in front of our eyes. When all else fails, they take you to war. And that's what I see coming on the horizon. It's definitely a scary possibility, and that raises the specter of Iran specifically. Do you think, uh, you know, I mean, a year ago, everybody thought war with Iran was literally around the corner, myself included. I, I mean, at least I thought that we really were on the precipice, but it seems more and more unlikely that they're ever going to build that momentum, that they're ever going to convince, you know, enough members of the military to go ahead and, and, and obey orders to invade Iran when we, we've seen them throw everything they can at this in terms of propaganda. It, it's a, going to be a different kind of war. You saw what's going on in Mali. Well, like, well, you mean like in the sense that we're already at war with Iran with sanctions? Well, we're at war with it. It is a war. It's an economic war. But what happened with Mali is a lesson for everyone. I mean, you have our Trends Journal. It went out a few days after France invaded Mali. And by the way, uh, the new numbers came out. I think this year, Mali, they, um, they dug up some 50 tons of gold, up 12% from the year before. And what happened was, and we wrote about it, that when... France invaded Mali. They were warned by the so-called terrorists that there was going to be payback. That's the word that they used. And that was written up in the Christian Science Monitor. Two days later, the Algerian crisis broke out where they overtook that, that plant out in the desert, the, the, the gas plant, the right. oil plant. And that's what you're going to see more of. They mm. say that generals keep fighting the last war. When I say a world war, you're going to see a different kind of war. You're going to see, you want to invade, oh, how many kids did they kill this week in, in Afghanistan? I think it was only two and two donkeys. Payback's a bitch. So you're going to start seeing world wars of weapons of mass destruction, wars of biological warfare, wars of dirty bombs. It's not going to be tanks rolling across the plains or, or F-35s or even drones. And so what they do is they put your nation in a state of terror. And you see how easy that's accomplished. And they'll do the same thing now. Raise fear and hysteria, take more control of the, over the lives of the people. And at the same time, as the economies are declining, it kind of gets their minds off things when survival is the major aspect. Do you think the dollar is going to collapse? I think what they're going to do is they're going to debase the currency because it's not only the dollar. As I mentioned, you're seeing what's going on in the European Union. Well, they have names for it. In the United States, they call it quantitative well, hold, hold on. Yeah, no, they, they are debasing. And I think everybody's uh, would they be are. in, a, in agreement. Are. Right. It's, it's, it can, it's, a, it's a continuous process built into the nature. But specifically, uh, the, the point of collapse where you have hyperinflation or, or these fiat currencies become simply impractical or unusable, is, is that point coming? Yes, it will come at some point. Again, it, but it's the reason why the dollar isn't only collapsing, 
is because they're all doing it. They're all debasing their currencies. As I said, they call it quantitative easing here. They call it OMT, ongoing monetary transactions in Europe. They're doing the same thing now at the Bank of Japan. So they're all getting cheaper. So it's not a matter of inflation. To me, it's a matter of debasement. And so, for example, if you live in, in Zimbabwe and you're buying a pound of coffee, the price of the pound of coffee hasn't gone up. The value of the currency has gone down. Right. And that's what I believe they're going to do. They are doing it. When will it crash? They keep making up all of these schemes undreamed of. Again, who knew that for the last several years they were rigging the LIBOR rates? I mean, that's a big one. Okay. So you don't know what scam they're going to come up with. Well, Mr. Salente, I, I, I love this methodology that you apply. I, I really appreciate this analysis and this the, the, these kinds of conversations of looking forward are, are, are something that I've, I've become... Uh, fascinated with, and I, and I feel almost like a, a kindred spirit in the way that, that you do try to look forward. But I do feel that there is something fundamentally wrong with the lens through which you are looking at the future. And I want to give you a chance to respond to some specific claims here. But there are a lot of young libertarians now who are going, wait a second, we have seen, and, and, and I know you're a political atheist, but you, you, you do have a very strong uh, libertarian following and you have in, in many ways an understanding of currencies that is similar to that of, of Austrian economists but we have been you know for years for as long as I've been a libertarian since I was in high school listening to older libertarians say the dollar's about to collapse that the revolution's about to, it's right around the corner you know we're gonna have all this thing it's all it's, it's about to happen in the next year you know we, we've seen these predictions over and over and over again and you for 2012 predicted specifically that America will become an undeveloped nation, that we'd have food riots, that uh, food would be more valuable than, than presents under the Christmas tree, and that, and that there would be tax riots. Now, I don't disagree when you say that there are trends that point in these directions, but for those of us who are with a younger perspective looking forward more, I, I, you know, when, when we hear these things, we have to have a certain skepticism, and when I see uh, you know, all of these predictions for, for doom and gloom, and, and I wouldn't go so far as some, some of your accusers in calling it pessimism porn, but there is a certain optimism that is, that is present now as people look to technology, to bitcoins, to all the ways in which if there were such a collapse, we would find a better way short of riots, short of collapse. You know, and, and maybe your predictions are simply wrong on the timeline, but for 2012, you were predicting a lot more calamity than actually happened. Yes, I was. And again, I have no way of knowing that they're doing deals behind the scenes. Right. So, for example, I had no idea when I made that prediction that the Federal Reserve was dumping out, I believe it was $18 trillion into the financial systems around the world to keep propping it up. I didn't know that. I didn't know that they would continue to lower interest rates and sacrifice the, the value of the dollar long term and keep the Ponzi scheme going. I did not know that American capitalism would be killed by four words, too big, too fair. <laughs> and so I don't know that they're doing these deals behind the scenes. And so that's what, and that's what I, I mentioned earlier, that no one could predict the future because there were too many wild cards. Well, well this, is, this those, is where... I made those forecasts based on the available information, not what was going on behind the scenes and a takeover by the Federal Reserve of the entire monetary system of the United States at levels that we've never seen before. Well, this is, this is really important, and it gets to, I, I think, the way that the, the libertarian understanding, specifically, of the nature of government can help even better in predicting than analyzing trends. And, and you, you point at something very, very important here, that any time you look at these macroeconomic trends, it's truly impossible to say this is going to happen now or this is going to happen then, because 
they are based on the decisions of a very few number of men behind closed doors. And I, th I think that's absolutely true. But if you, if you come to a better understanding of what those people are thinking and, and what their motivation are, or motivations are, you would see like this idea of uh, your idea of a holiday shift. We should not be surprised that the banksters, the super class that's particularly benefiting from the exploitation of the American government, is going to try to keep us citizens of the empire fat and happy. That it is going, that it is not going to let the dollar collapse, uh, and and by that I mean crash, not collapse, because people say, well, it is collapsing, yes, and then it's been collapsing since it was started. But that that crash will never come because it kind of is discrediting to them. And I'd like to think that uh, when, when people say what you're descri you describe your work as pessimism porn, that it's really the opposite. Because in a sense, it's optimistic in thinking that the scams of government are going to run out, that this exploitation by fiat currency, is the, 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 you know, the jig is up and it's, it's going to stop at some point. But I think a, a, a better understanding, at least from what I've developed from my d uh, ability to look forward in, in seeing this understanding of, of what government is for what it is leads me to believe that there, there isn't going to be a point of collapse or calamity, but that we're going to see a, a smoother transition away from these things, that the, the trends, if anything, uh, predict not crises, but a continuous evolution away from these rackets and towards a freer society. I think you have to look at what's going on in Europe. And what's going on in Europe, I thought was also going to happen in the United States. Mm. Again, look at this last weekend. Millions of people throughout Portugal took to the streets. Go back to last weekend. Millions and millions of people took to the streets in Spain. Look what's going on in Greece. You want to talk about a collapse? Take a trip over to Cyprus. You need some more information? Take go over to Bulgaria and Slovenia. Look what's going on in Ireland. So yes, the people are taking to the streets in massive numbers. However, in America, the people are so, as I see it, they're, they're so drugged out on prescription drugs. They've lost their zeal to stand up and fight. And all you had to see was this last election of a lesser of two evils. And yes, it's true that 11 million less people turned out to the polls, but there was still no great revolt. You look at what's going on now with this, with this sham going on in Washington. First it was the physical cliff, right. and now it's this sequester. You have 12% of the people only support what's going on with Congress. Yet when the elections come around, what do they do? Like little girls and boys, they go out to the polls and believe the big lie that their vote makes a difference. So Americans, to me, have lost, and I'm not talking about all of them. I'm talking about the majorities, have lost the zeal to stand up and fight. And yes, there are the group of libertarians we just had a, a meeting over here in Kingston, Colonial Kingston, where I live, uh, upstate New York, on, on gun control. And a couple of thousand people turned out at the Ulster Center for Performing Arts to, to protest uh, Governor Cuomo's draconian efforts to stop people from owning guns. So yes, there is that movement, but it's, it's so small right now in the United States, that at this time, I don't see a nation with a zeal to fight. But you are seeing it around the world. Mm. And I thought the same thing was going to happen here. Well, I hope it's more of a human nature-based will to evolve and a little more global and long-term than that. But let me, we just have time for just one last quick question. And I'll bet you've got an awesome, clever uh, <laughs> answer ready for this. Are, do you describe yourself as an optimist or a pessimist? Neither. It's what is. You go to a doctor and you get a diagnosis. It gives you the <laughs> diagnosis. It doesn't make him an optimist or a pessimist. I only look at the information for what it is and not the way I want it to be. Do I believe that we could rise to a higher level and create a greater future? Read the Trends Journal. It's in every one of them. The future is in our hands. But nothing is going to change, as I see it, 
until the individual changes. And for me to see the individual change, people have to gain that courage, that dignity, that respect, that passion and integrity within themselves before anything else changes. I would certainly say we're evolving to that. And I apologize, sir. We have one last question from the chat, courtesy of Daryl. Hit it. What type of regulation do you see against Bitcoin in the near future? Uh, they'll do anything they can to stop anything that stops the money junkies from getting their, yep. their needed fix. Great question. Great answer. Mr. Salente, thank you, sir, so much for joining us. Ladies and gentlemen, Gerald Salente of TrendsResearch.com. And lots of financial news that is going to back up these analysis. And, and, and I think to, to be able to look at this, it's such a fun exercise. It's so important to be able to, to take an honest look at the future based on, on viewing current trends. And, and I apologize. Are we, we have our, our next guest.